Jimmy, we looked at a lot of uh, issue ones, a lot of uh, starts to series here on the channel. We're going to take a look at a good one today with Tom Strong number one. Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jimmy and I are on the race to 100,000 subscribers here on the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Get us there. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. It helps us out a lot. Uh, we have a Patreon, and the King Kayfabers on the Patreon benefit from getting the videos before anybody else. They're also hanging out with us uh, in a live stream recording session that we do each week. And uh, it's a way to get a leg up on the things that we're talking about on the aftermarket. Uh, we also have 1,700 videos out in the wild. Probably talked about your favorite comics. So hit the magnifying glass on the front page of the Kayfabe channel. And uh, search for your favorite titles. Check out those episodes. Without further ado, Jimmy, America's Best Comics, ABC, June 1999. We're looking at Tom Strong, number one. Great Heck cover. Heck of a creative team, too, man. Alan Moore, Chris ba Sprouse, Al Gordon on the inks, uh, Alex Ross painting the cover. Done up to look like a proper magazine, the way the graphic design is laid out. Because you know you've got um, Todd Klein. In yeah, the... Todd Klein, lettering, logos, and design. Yeah. Yeah, so you got you got a, you got A-list uh, talent here. You know what is curious to me, Jimmy? The, uh, the copyrights and stuff published by America's Best Comics. Copyright America's Best Comics, LLC curious what that is yeah i don't know I, I remember this because it was like alan moore had been fooling around since the early mid 90s with these image and turn to superheroes and stuff like that and it felt like this was a very coherent very measured on his part like he had come back taken a look dipped his toe in the waters of what superhero comics were at that time and as you say antidote to those kinds of comics and uh, i think he even may have said so in interviews where he talked about trying to fix some of the stuff that watchmen did it is and it is the thing that he that he he brought to the to the fore uh and created the kind of gritty aesthetic that that comics would would then go on and take this is him trying to to sort of rewrite that stuff if you guys are going to crib me well let's do a different brand of storytelling and in fact it, it's it's in a lot of inter interviews between he himself and Dave Gibbons, where they were talking about like if they were to do a project after Watchmen, like they were talking about doing Captain Marvel and doing something magical and you know talking tigers and you know a lot of stuff that he explored even in the pages of Supreme really. Uh, so, you know, started off with a brand new set of comics. You know, we had Tom Strong, we had Promethea, we had Top Ten. And then we had, what was the other one? T Tomorrow Stories. Tomorrow Stories. Uh, so he had a, a wing of comics. And one of the, that was probably like some of the last um, Wizards that I bought. It came with a f kind of full size, like ash can with a bunch of, uh, I think it had a lot of um, Alex Ross like sketches. No, that was Supreme stuff. But there was, there was a push for America's Best Comics. Timing-wise, I think League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is around the same time, too. It is, and I always lump it in with this, but I right. don't think it is. And what ultimately happens is, uh, you know, Scott Dunbeer's name's on here, so it's got the Jim Lee stink on it, and then Jim Lee's going to sell Wildstorm to DC, and it becomes a de facto... It's a DC comic. It becomes a DC comic. Alan Moore is working for DC Comics again. Yeah, that was a big, weirdly a big piece of the DC buying Wild Storm was what's going to happen with Alan Moore. Right. And, and I mean, he does go away. Like, it, like it does stop. But he does talk about, uh, and, and Rob Liefeld parodies it in uh, our original shoot interview with him where he's talking about the, uh, the firewall. Like Scott Dunbeer and those guys are like the firewall between DC Comics and Alan Moore. He doesn't want to hear anything from Paul Levitz or Jeanette Kahn or any of those characters. At Biscor here, going to have a solo art show with all the best hip-hop family tree uh, artwork at uh, the 707 Gallery in downtown Pittsburgh from April 6th through the end of August. If you're going to be in town, make sure you uh, swing through downtown Pittsburgh. Check out that art show. I also have the Switchblade Shorties daily comic strip that I'm presenting to you on all of my social media platforms. And there's a dedicated uh, webtoon where you can get the latest Switchblade Shorties comics. Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus, 40% off on Amazon right now. X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback. Three flavors of Red Room. 
Crypto Killer's Trade Paperback, Trigger Warnings, and The Antisocial Network. Jimmy has Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. He's self-publishing some stuff. True Crime Funnies, Black and White Zine, and the 1986 Zine are available at his website, jimrug.com. The Jim Rug Hulk Grand Design is uh, out of print in its Treasury Edition format, but it's coming to you soon in trade paperback. Now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to the video. So let's jump into things, Jimmy. Uh, the creative team with Chris Sprouse and Alan Moore was already established uh, in the pages of, uh, of all places. Rob, Rob Layfield's Supreme Comics. Uh, heck of a hand, Chris Sprouse. Yeah, I like his stuff a lot. And I think, again, if you're doing this comic and you're trying to look different than like kind of the 90s superhero stuff, this is the antidote. You don't have all the cross hatching. You don't have all of the uh, the overly detailed kind of pouches and bullet casings and all that stuff. And it's beautiful. Like, I think he's, you know, I, I like looking at his art. Yeah, I do too. Uh, it's interesting seeing him do um, Bigfoot cartooning because he, he isn't quite up to that challenge. Uh, this is a little, you know, Timmy Toolbox kid. Uh, pr pretty pretty weird looking fuck. Uh, this this kind of um, copy paste of big JPEGs into a comic like that. That's an affectation of like turn of the century, you know, 21st century comics where people would uh just do that. I think they do that to this day a lot in um, main, mainstream comics, but we in independent comics know that if you're going to reduce something like that, then trace it off and draw it, because it, it just is very uh, disjointed. So we have our little guy uh, clearly in a futuristic city. Uh, he has kind of like, he's part of the, like the little Orphan Annie fan club, except in this comic, uh, it's, it's the Tom Strong fan club. And he's got his little origin comic. So we're sort of breaking the fourth wall a little bit. And uh, when you see the desaturated or just like almost the um, the flat color, that's your modern day. And it's a, it's a it's a bizarro world, right? Where when we look at the 1899 stuff, we're getting into full bore computer color. And the origin, uh, the origin is Tarzan origin, basically. You know, you have these little, these rich fucks who commission a boat, get, uh, get, you know, stuck on an island. And it is the island that they planned on going to anyhow. But uh, it might as well be Mr. and Mrs. Greystoke. Thomas's mustache is really bizarre. Yeah, a little Gigi Allen-ish, perhaps. Huge on the sides and then like little skinny in the middle. Yeah. Catfish. They're, when they get to the island, uh, they don't know that there are natives there or anything like that. And, and uh, he, you know, Th Thomas, he's got he's got uh, some experiments that he wants to run. Uh, there is some great nonverbal storytelling here, where uh, <laughs> the guy that they commissioned to to helm the ship, like he's toast. S sorry for him, he's dead. We let's retrieve the equipment. We see the lady mourning the guy. And basically, she's she was fucking she was fucking the 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 boat guy. No. Oh, da absolutely, absolutely. Do you think the boat captain is uh, Tom's uh, dad? No, no, no. Like he he's he's pregnant. Yeah, I mean it's a white guy. You know, this is a black dude. But there are several pieces here non-verbally where she uh, she's definitely she fucked uh, the the captain. It's a joke. Like this part is a joke, man. I don't read it that way. I think she's just uh, sad that he's dead. She probably hasn't been around death very much. Yeah, I don't know, man. She's It's like banging the pool boy. Do you think Thomas knows and that's why he's standing far off? No, no. I think he's... Yeah, I think he's... Dude, I think it's... This is uh, Reed Richards. This is Sue Storm and fucking like Namor type shit where he's more interested in his gizmos and stuff. And she just, you know, she wants some cock. Do you think she's going to hook up with a pneumatic man now? Might be built for it. <laughs> Might have magic fingers. But it is steampunk. You know, you, you recognize the, the, the boiler and, and those bits. So steampunk is a part of it. I don't know that we got much steampunk in Alan Moore comics previous to this. I bet Sprouse designed that pneumatic man character. Because uh, I think it works really well, but I think that you'd have to, whoever's drawing it, if it's going to look good, you need to design it sure. yourself. Yeah. You know, in a way that it makes sense to you, because it's really an odd design, but I, it does kind of work. 
Alan Moore was had the pick of the litter. So we have Chris Sprouse here, who already was shown and proven, and I think that they won every conceivable award that one can uh, could win with their work on uh, Supreme. So they were uh, in stone. With Promethea, you had um, J.H. Williams, who was not a name that I knew before Promethea. I don't know where he comes from, but but uh, man, he rose to the task and really was a fantastic fit and went on to a very big, prominent career. And then uh, top 10 is Gene Ha. And all Gene Ha did at that moment was, um, I remember him from uh, Cyclops and Jean Grey. There was like a four issue miniseries. That's like where he showed up. And it was like, who the fuck is this guy? This is amazing. And then he did like the covers for the 1 million issues of DC Comics. Yeah, I didn't realize that. It was like an initiative there. And then and then he went to like top 10. Like, like I don't know anything else that, that, that he did, but he was clearly dope. That's all a bunch of young artists. It's the new guys. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the new crop. You know, the best of the new crop. Uh, but put something in the comments. I am curious where J.H. Williams comes from. I suppose I could do a Wikipedia, but... <laughs> this is so creepy, too, man. Whenever uh, Thomas is, like, making his advances. See, this is the thing, too, man. She's, like, kind of, like, lukewarm on the cock with uh, old Thomas. You know, it's, it's, you know she's, she's, she's done with that. She's thinking about that boat captain, dude. And uh, the, the, the static, pneumatic man just kind of staring and watching. <laughs> that feels like The Matrix. Prequel to The Matrix. Birth sequence. Tastefully done. And now we realize they're not alone on the island. Yes, sir. That birth got everybody's attention. End of part one, and we now launch back into the modern day. This is one of those uh, sequences that that I really like in comics when when it's pulled off, and it's uh, it's where there's like two stories going on at uh, at the same time. We have the little boy character who's so stoked on his comics and so stoked on the adventures that are happening on the page that he doesn't even notice, you know, the real world adventure that's that's happening, you know, in in his midst. Yeah, which includes a window shattering, literally the window behind him. Right. You know, this is an era, man, where you had to put a graphics card into your uh, computer to play any cool games. And that first appearance of Tom Strong coming through with the big, broad shoulders. Uh, it's an evolution. It's like the comic book evolution of Bruce Timm's Batman, in a way, where it would have more shading, more modeling, a little bit more detail. But it, I, that feels like a genesis point for... Like the Chris Sprouse strongman character is like Bruce Tim. Would you agree? Yeah, I think he does have those proportions. That 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 shoulder thing. It's just very pleasing. Yeah. So it might even be that they're sharing the same genesis point. Because you know I'm not sure where Bruce Tim's comes from either, but, yeah, uh, but it is that same uh, same earlier. figure. Yeah, yeah. Bruce yeah, Tim and I don't know if all... you can be in comics and in, in this time period and not be affected by the Bruce Tim designs. Yeah, pretty fun too. Like the way he's what we're seeing. You know, there's a lot off camera. Right. What a contrast style-wise from like a panel like this to a panel like this. Mm -hmm. It's not like he can't put detail in or doesn't put detail in. It's just not always there. Yeah, it's true. So a little bit of development on the island. Uh, good old Thomas, Thomas Strong Sr., I guess, uh, it has put together inside that, that uh, crater of that volcano uh, uh, like a little gravitational room. So he's able to create... Uh, this environment to, to raise the boy in. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's a Superman origin kind of thing where, where uh, you know, Superman, he, he did not fly at first. He was able to leap tall buildings in a single bound because of gra gravity. But also in, um, I think there's like, there's a whole thing in, uh, in Dragon Ball comics where they practice with, with weighted clothes yeah. so that when you take the weighted clothes off, like they could like levitate and it's yeah. funny. Some, some, uh, a wide range from playing with a block to very thick books <laughs> right. that, that apparently he is uh, also reading. <laughs> and, and those blocks, don't, they, they don't look light. No, they don't. They got rivets. Boy, those suits that uh, Thomas and his wife wear to go visit. <laughs> pretty, pretty heavy duty. Still steampunk with like gauges and stuff, kind of right. like big old scuba equipment. 
and there they are on the on the hill looking looking over the the tribe and i guess the volcano becomes active again and just destroys kills the family kills mom and dad playing with those dark dark colors once again i, I would like i would like a little desaturation on on our focal points it gets it gets really muddy Someone should do the supercut of us criticizing the digital coloring. And it wouldn't take much, because this is probably the best coloring of the day. But you just gotta, like, you know, when you hold your head back, like, what are we supposed to look at in any of these panels? Even if it's dark, you, there's, there's ways to do it. You know what you could do, too? Because when you look back, what you see are word balloons. Like, those exactly. word balloons don't have to be white. Yeah, You know, exactly. if you're really making, like, I don't know, going for an effect of, like, hey, all the electricity's out, we are really in trouble here... You could do it with everything. You could do it with the gutters and the word balloons if you really wanted to emphasize color storytelling here. With the rim lighting on our Tom Strong on these ankles, Charles Burns comes to mind. Yeah. And coming down from the mountain, we have a young Tom Strong carrying uh, his dead parents in tow with some digital tears on the last page there of... Uh, Part, part two. Inexplicably just whipping a boulder out of the... Because if you look, he's not buried under a boulder. Like, it doesn't make sense. He's just <laughs> mad, I guess. Funny drawing here. Proportion-wise, I think that little head, and we don't get to see the big shoulders. Like, right. There's just some, some oddities there. By the way, man, put on some bulk in those legs from the uh, whenever they were just backlit on the previous page. It's a lot of male upper thigh to be looking at too with them shorts man you need to go get you some some nike uh basketball draws uh, i've never seen an origin comic i've never seen an issue one done like this and i think that it's a very very strong approach uh because it's no pun intended yeah because it creates that ability to info dump by by uh by way of the Tom Strong comic that the boy is reading and then you get to see where things are modern day like clearly the world has advanced beyond uh man it, this is like really pleasing compared because i guess what the stuff would have been uh, at the time it would have been you w the brian hitch era of of comics and the really really overly done colored comics of like the ultimates line ultimate spider-man ultimate uh x-men with that was like i pretty much just like penciled like digitally painted like uh i don't know those books at all yeah I think all of those are around around this time. This this might come b uh, before. You know what's funny is the Brian Hitch stuff. Like I was thinking, Authority. I think that's about the same time. Also, Wild Storm. Exactly. Is that like the late nineties? Yeah. I mean, that's that's probably close to about this time. I think it's the same. Yeah. That's like Wild Storm. I feel like figured out a lot of different successful stuff right before they sold to DC. I used yeah. to read, like, all the interviews and stuff online when I was trying to look busy at work. Yeah. And I remember, like, the interviews made the stuff... I didn't read any of the books. But the interviews made them sound different from one another and kind of interesting. Like, they had their own... You know, they had worked out their concepts. By the way, uh, in pro wrestling parlance, that is the definition of hot shotting. Hot shotting isn't just getting super key people, A-listers, onto your product. The sales part of it is where the hot shotting comes in, where you build up your brand. Like what would happen in pro wrestling is you would have a shit territory that you wanted to divest yourself from. So then you would call in Andre the Giant. You would call in the 10 big, biggest you know, midget talents. You would get Hulk Hogan to show up. And then you would be able to present to a potential buyer the gate receipts for these shows so that whenever you factor in your multiple for the sales, like, you goose your numbers. So that's what Wildstorm hotshotted at the end there and then was able to put their multiple on it and get some money off of, um, off of DC. It makes me wonder, too, because, like, we've been looking at Wizards and we're up to 97 and things are bad. But at this point, it's like 90... This is 99, right? Yeah. At this point, I feel like there's a whole bunch of different energies happening. You know, like you could look at whatever Marvel's starting to do with probably Joe Q is there, yeah. starting Ultimates, or, or starting like the Ultimate line, Ultimate Spider-Man, I feel like was something that people really kind of Absolutely. enjoyed. Uh, maybe Bendis on Daredevil at that point. And it feels like there are these like a bunch of different energies firing up, you know, almost like, yeah, let's get the comic thing back on track. And it's not like one thing. 
it's like, yeah, get Alan Moore to do a line of superhero comics. Get, you know, a good team and a couple of these Marvel books. And it's like you get, like, a number of these things moving in the right direction. And together they are able to, like, yeah, okay, yeah. we got some momentum. There's a lot of room to move. Guys, we ain't doing anything right. We barely scraped by 97, 98, 96. Like, let's, let's put a bunch of energy out there and see what the hell comes back as feedback. This is a really impressive, to me, this is a really impressive issue one because there's so much stuff that we get to see in a very figured out form. Yeah. You know, like a lot of comics, like we look at so many number ones and it's like, you'll see some potential or there's a, there's a germ that's good, but they probably have to pivot in other ways. This feels like a pretty big concept that was worked out before we got to, uh, you know, issue one here. Alan Moore is, is good at that. And, uh, Look at Twilight of the Superheroes and the work that he did on that. It, it was just a pitch. Uh, the work that was done as a precursor to Watchmen, it's interesting to think about because the more that I get into writers and their process just for my own works, two schools of thought. And the Alan Moore school of thought is like info dump ahead of time and like build this whole world to have it so so clear in your head. Uh, when you go to like the Aaron Sorkin, David Mamet vision, they're like doing that kind of stuff, knowing that your character liked peanut butter when they were six, is the equivalent to actors, you know, wanting to know their motivation or like going off to to uh to do a residency at a hospital when they're a nurse or something. It's like it's magical thinking and it's a waste of time. Like that's what they say. So it's interesting because he definitely has like these fully realized ideas with each of the different A B C titles. You know, he had some very, very clear, strong visions and, and ideas of where this stuff was going. So, young Tom Strong, we're in 1921. He has brought electricity to to, uh, to the island. I love that the pneumatic man is Newman. Yeah. <laughs> man, and look at that island, dude. Like, completely rebuilt the... Uh... The, the whole structure of that volcano. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, that's one of those thematic things. Moore is so good at pacing his stories and having these kind of, like, callbacks and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's what Dad was able to accomplish. And then, you know, this is what Tom Strong's able to accomplish. He eats some special roots or seeds or fruits or something that, that keeps him young. That's, that's like, one of the, the deals. So when we see him in Millennium City in the future... And he still kind of like looks the same. That's that's the deal. Running a great piece of game right here, uh, where the chick who eventually becomes his wife, he sons are down and, and is like, "Yeah, you're like a little sister to me." It's a, that's a that's a good line. Look at his catamaran's a steamship. Yeah. And then once again, a great piece of nonverbal storytelling. The girl just like looking off into the distance, man, kind of alone with her thoughts. And then modern day. Let's see uh, what Tom Strong is up to. Look at this technique. Yeah, you don't see that often in uh, comics where you, you take the background imagery, invert it, and wobble it up to make it look like water. <laughs> so that's two pages of him going off uh, to the States. Comes back, gets married to the old, old gal. <laughs> great little uh, conversation between the two on their their uh, marriage day where he's talking about you know I, I love the idea of scampering little feet and blah 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 and she's like oh you want to have a baby he's like nah man I was thinking about uh, doing some experimentation on monkeys so in the very next page we get both <laughs> right we get his daughter and we get the monkey that he's modified you know what is interesting uh, not too f far after this you get the uh, Frank Whiteley Grant Morrison, X, New X-Men, and Beast ain't that different. Mm. So we were introduced to the full cast. There it is on that splash page. Yeah, and you see the salt and pepper coming into our, our guy's hair there. Yeah, he's got the temples. I mean, what is he, 100 years old at this point? Yeah. <laughs> we we cap it off the boy by the time he uh, gets home from school or... Or uh, he, by the time he gets to school, finished reading his comic, pops out, and uh, the legit Tom Strong is there. Knows that the boy is number two fifty nine. You know, face front, true believer. And then that's when our little guy realizes that uh, he actually, he might have had contact with the with the real Tom Strong. 
this is the series really man like Todd Klein really you know he's digital at this point and he was really earning his money's worth by by playing with a lot of fonts and and uh, graphic design and things man they, they really they really let him loose with the aesthetics look at how uncanny this piece is man that looks like a real sort of dead type of uh, comic illustration that is Chris Sprouse and Angus McKee oh yeah okay cool yeah I, Angus uh Mackay, as uh, oh, Dave, Gib Dave Gibbons would call him, is, he would be right. I'm sure is the guy who introduces uh, the computer to people like Dave Gibbons and Brian Bolland. So he's the early digital mave, and he's the across the pond version of uh, John Kuramoto, who would be the Chris Ware, uh, Dan Klaus. Tech, it, rem tech it reminds me of when John Byrne hooked up with uh, yeah. the, the one painter for like some of those Next Men covers, where it'd be like no line no holding lines you know it's kind of like a weird uncanny valley of comic book art yeah very very bleeding edge stuff comics said not too much of comics look like this but you could probably find a good you know 10 12 pieces see it would be this stuff that would be in the that wizard um book i i hope with the issues of wizard were, were that packed with i hope i have those like in the poly bag and stuff because it was like a pretty substantial little thing it had had some Alex Ross sketches and it had the, the the elevator pitch. Did we look at this before? No, but I can't I, remember if we did. But the beginning part is Tom is Tom Strong yeah, stuff. Yeah, see, all this stuff would show up in there. This could be episode. <laughs> Motor oil. I don't even know what to make of that. <laughs> <laughs> Man, they 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 sold some business. I guess so. Good to go. Yes. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. Jimmy and I are on the road to one hundred thousand subscribers. So if you have not uh, done so yet and you enjoy our content, please subscribe to the channel. Helps us out a lot. We have a Patreon where the King K Fabers on the Patreon get access to all the videos uh, before anybody else mitigates the K Fabe effect and uh, is another way to support the channel. Ultimately, however, our books are the way that uh, we're able to keep bringing you these videos on the regular. Jimmy, please let the people know what you have out in the wild, man. Yeah, best thing to do for my latest comics is patreon.com slash jimrug. It's where I've been scanning and posting pages as I as I do my self-published stuff. In comic shops, you can find Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, and Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. These are my two Street Angel collections. All the Street Angel comics are in these two books from Image, so you can get them wherever you get Image comics or books. Um, the stuff I've been self-publishing, I'm selling on jimrug.com. That's the 1986 zine, the BW zine, and True Crime Funnies, uh, some nonfiction, a nonfiction anthology featuring three stories, including uh, two wrestling stories in there. So you can find those on my website or on patreon.com slash jimrug. And the Hulk Grand Design, that nice oversized one, is out of print. However, a new trade paperback is coming out in May from Marvel, and you can pre-order that one now wherever you buy books. And I ask you to please do so because it lets Marvel know to keep these things in print. I'm going to have a solo art show here in Pittsburgh at the uh, 707 Gallery, downtown Pittsburgh, beginning April 6th. It's going to be up uh, through August. So if you are swinging through Pittsburgh, uh, check it out. I, I, I don't think that there's any charge to check it out. And it's all, all of my best hip hop family tree pieces presented to you uh, as beautifully as we can uh, possibly do it. So this is the daily strip that I've been working on for uh, 2024, presenting it to you on all of, all of our social media platforms. There's a webtoon platform and such. Uh, stay tuned for news on this in the future. And I present uh, material ahead of time on, on my own Patreon. Uh, Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus. Uh, you might still be able to get it pretty cheap on uh, Amazon. It was like 40% off fairly recently. Best book I made to date. A uh, bunch of extra pages. If you got the original Hip Hop Family Tree, uh, there's almost 200 pages worth of stuff in here that you haven't seen yet. The X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback is in the wild right now. We recently released Red Room Crypto Killers trade paperback. It contains four self-contained stories uh, in the Red Room universe. There are two other Red Room trade paperbacks. Once again, each of these all contain self-contained stories. So you can start at any place. And if you dig the material, then by all means, check out another uh, Red Room comic. Once again, the, the books are the most important way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. But there are some direct ways to support uh, this YouTube channel. Jimmy, let the people know. 
You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe E newsletter at the links below this video. We'll keep you up to date on new releases and upcoming appearances. You can also buy Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it. All good ways to support the channel. Give them those marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.